Hello, and welcome back to further lectures about functions and their representations. When last we met, we had done a deep dive into visual graphical representations, the graph of a function. Um, and I want to go a little further into that. In particular, I want to observe something kind of curious, which is that um, you can, um, sorry, I just have to turn my pen on. You, um, you can draw graphs which do not represent functions. This graph doesn't represent a function. How do I know? Because if I give it an input, like say two, remember the rule is find two on the x-axis, draw a vertical line, and ask where it hits the, um, uh, where it hits the y, the, the curve, asks for the y value, and it hits the curve in two places. So it looks like about 1.7 and also minus 1.7. There is not a unique output associated to one input. Okay, so this is not a function. It's some kind of weird, more general relation. Uh, so that suggests, you can see, we see exactly visually why it failed, because there was a vertical line that is an x value that hit the curve in two places. So this gives us what's called the vertical line test. Okay, and I left out the keyword, so I'm going to go um, go back and fix it. The vertical line test says a graph represents a function if and only if no vertical line touches the curve in two places. Um, so that construction, if and only if, shows up a lot in mathematics. So that's saying, if it's a function, then no vertical line touches the curve in two places. And if no vertical line touches the curve in two places, it's a function. They're the same thing. If and only if comes up a lot in mathematics. Okay, um, And because we just showed, I just showed you a vertical line that touches this curve in two places, it's not a function. On the other hand, Here's one that is a function. Here, you draw any vertical line. It touches the curve in one place. Well, you might argue, oh, what about over here? Maybe that vertical line touches the curve later when the curve climbs up, or maybe it never touches. Either one is fine. It's okay for the vertical line never to touch it or to touch it once. It's just not allowed to touch it twice. Okay. So whether or not something is a function is really clearly articulated by this very visual check. Does a vertical line touch it twice? Okay, so let's return to algebraic representations. It was one kind of, you've, you're used to them, we've done a lot with them, but I want you to, something we will do a bunch, I want to remind you of, and it will be an opportunity to remind you of some, some simple algebraic things. Remember, f of 1 is expressed by plugging 1 in for x wherever you see x. There's a really helpful way to do this in complicated formulas, which is just to replace every x by a pair of parentheses and then put the number inside the parentheses. Why do I do that? I'll show you in a minute. Um, so 
1 squared plus 1 plus 3 is 1 plus 1 plus 3, which is 5. 2 squared plus 2 plus 3 is 4 plus 2 plus 3, which is 9. Okay? You don't have to plug a number in. You can plug another symbol in. So if you plug A in for X, everywhere you see X, you replace it with an A. A squared plus A plus 3. A picture that I find really helpful, people often get really thrown by doing this, it is simpler than your mind may make it. So the picture I have is if you imagine writing an essay in Word, getting to the end of it and realize that everywhere you spelled lose, which is spelled L-O-S-E, you spelled it L-O-O-S-E, right? You made an error. In Word, you can say find and replace. You say find every instance of loose and replace it with lose. And Word will happily go through the whole document and whatever it sees L-O-O-S-E, it will replace it with L-O-S-E. Um, and you have to be careful, right? Because sometimes you wrote footloose. You didn't want it to fix that one, but it will anyway. You want to be like Word. Whatever, Wherever you see an X, you just replace it with whatever is in parentheses. And here, you know, here's the example where the parentheses really help. So you can begin to see why, why it's tricky and why the parentheses help. When I replace x with 2a, kind of a complicated expression, the parentheses reminds me that all of 2a needs to get squared. Okay, So um, that's equal to 4a squared, right? Because 2a squared is 2 squared times a squared. So it's 4a squared plus 2a plus 3. That's sort of the first really interesting one. And you can see the parentheses remind you that you apply whatever the formula is to everything inside. Here's another more interesting example. The expression a plus 1, everywhere you see x, then you have to do a little work, right? Remember, FOIL, a plus 1 squared is a squared plus 2 times a times 1 plus 1 squared. We're also adding a plus 1, and then we're adding 3. And I helpfully wrote these in columns so that you can see we get a squared plus a total of 3a. Oops, undo that. And here's 2a plus a is 3a. 1 plus 1 plus 3 is 5. Okay. So you can, by plugging things into the function, you can get very different results out. And I just want to observe, when I write 2 times f of a, that's equal to 2 times whatever f of a is. So in this case, it's equal to 2 times, in parentheses, a squared plus a plus 3, which is 2a squared plus 2a plus 6. Notice that's really different from f of 2a. Multiplying by 2 inside the parentheses and outside the parentheses do very different things. Um, that's really going to matter to us in a little bit. Okay, what I want to do now for the rest of this lecture and on into the next is I want to give you some classes of functions that we are going to spend a lot of attention on. They'll get broader and more complicated. We'll start with the simplest kind of functions, which are called linear functions. So a linear function is of the form something times x plus something. 3 times x minus 2, minus a half x plus 4, 5x plus 0. Any of those are linear functions. So the general format, I'm going to be kind of color pedantic here, is y equals um, one number times x, which we'll usually call an m, in which 
I'm going to use blue for, plus another number which we'll call b. And the name for that number b is the y-intercept, and the name for the number m is the slope. Okay, so when I write y equals 3x minus 2, that's telling you that the slope m is 3, and that the y-intercept b is negative 2, because subtracting 2 is the same as adding negative 2. Um, why, are th why are they called that slope and y-intercept, and why are linear functions called linear? Because their graph is a straight line. Every linear function, every function you can write like this, has a graph which is a straight line, and almost every straight line graph is a linear function, in one exception. Um, the wonder, one of the wonderful things about linear functions, they're simple in every respect. They're visually simple, they're algebraically simple, but also their relationship is really simple. That is to say, as soon as you see the formula, oops, um, as soon as you see a formula for a linear function, you know how to graph it. So, two facts. One is B, the y-intercept, tells you where the line crosses the y-axis. So in our case, so I want to focus now on 3x minus 2. Here, I'm going to circle it in red and graph it in red. The y-intercept, which is minus 2, tells you that it crosses the y-axis at negative 2. That is this point here. Why is that? Well, of course, if you plug x equals 0 into this, you will get y equals negative 2. So when x is 0, y is negative 2. That's on the y-axis. Okay. The slope, in this case m equals 3, tells you how steep the line is. It tells you the rise over the run. So this is saying that each time you go over 1, you go up 3. Okay. So over 1, up 3, over 1, up 3, and if I had um, been more precise in my check marks, you would see that that gets you a line. Each time you go over one and up three, you stay on the same line. And it's pretty easy to see if you plug in different values of x differing by one. Each time x goes up by one, because you're multiplying it by three, y goes up by three. Okay, so that makes graphing really easy. Let's graph minus one half x plus four. The y-intercept is 4, so I go 1, 2, 3, 4. The slope is minus 1 half, so each time we go over 1, we go up minus a half, which is down a half. So here is y equals minus 1 half x plus 4. And let's pick one more color. Um, let's pick orange y equals 5x, when x equals 0, y is 0, and the slope is 5. Each time we go over 1, we go up 5, so that's very, very steep. Okay. Every linear equation gives you a line, linear function gives you a line. The line can be read off perfectly from it. Um, because linear functions are so simple, we're going to use them all the time as a starting point to understand more complicated functions and you're going to have to get very comfortable with working with linear functions. Um, I'm going to give you one more um, trick for working with linear functions.
you know that two points determine a line. If I give you two points, there's one line that they correspond to. So let's say the points um, negative 2, 1 and 1, 3. Okay? What's the equation of that line that goes through those two points? Well, here's the point negative 2, 1 on the graph, and here's the point um, 1, 3. So you can draw that line, but how's, what's the equation? Well, I can tell you the slope, right? The slope is the rise over the run. We went between these two points, we went over 2 and up 2. So we went up by the difference in the two y values, and we went over I said over 2, but I'm. we went over 3. I didn't draw it very well. We went over the difference in the two x values. Okay, So the slope is 2 over 1 minus negative 2, which is 3. The slope is 2 thirds. The y-intercept is trickier, but there's a neat trick for doing it. What always works is what's called the point-slope form. Instead of writing it as a function, y equals mx plus b, take one of the points. I'm going to pick this one, but it works for either one. y minus the y value, here's my y value, is equal to m, which we just figured out was 2 thirds, times the x value, times x minus the x value, sorry x minus the x value. Okay. That's the point-slope form of this line. And if you don't like it, I'm a little out of, out of room, so I'm going to have to go up here, sorry. Um, you can always solve for the usual form. So you can move the constant 3 over, you can distribute the 2 thirds, 